You see, the question up there today is, is God fair? I'm sure that is a question, if you've walked any time with God, that has run across your mind. A thought that's come in. And all of this doesn't seem quite right. It doesn't seem like this is the way God would have had it to be. This doesn't seem right. Is God fair? Well, we're nearing the end of the book of Malachi. We've been going through it for quite a time now. And a while back, you can remember verse 1 stated that this book was the burden of the prophet Malachi. Now, what was the burden that he had? Now, that's what we've been unpacking uh, since that first message and these series of messages. That God loves us and shows us that if we are willing to see it. But often, <clears throat> His love is not returned. The song that we sung a little while ago was Praise You in This Storm by Casting Crowns. It was inspired by the book of Job a little bit, but also by the experience of a young girl named Erin Browning. The band made arrangements to meet Erin. Erin was a young girl who had arranged a dance at her public school uh, using one of the band's songs. And you know in our day and age, that's kind of stepping out there to use the Christian songs at the public school, isn't it? Well, they agreed to go meet her on Valentine's Day 2004 before one of their concerts. And right around that time that the band connected with Erin and her family was when she found out that she had cancer. She died on November 1st 2004, just nine months later after their meeting. Now, we tend to want to cry, that's not fair when we don't get that promotion at work, right? Or we don't get that deal that we wanted, or maybe that, that certain someone that's caught our eye just doesn't have any certain feelings back for us, and it bothers us, and we made these prayers to God, and God didn't come through on something like that. But can you imagine... How this family felt. Take for just a moment to imagine how this family felt. They had stood out for God. They had stepped out, right? And yet, it seemed like God allowed this little girl to, to die. To all the outward sign, this little girl had stood up for Jesus for this song and her public dance. Then God rewarded her by giving her cancer to kill her. Now, according to the lead singer, Mark Hall, it just doesn't seem fair. But the difference that Mark saw in their life was even though that it wasn't fair, they didn't live like it wasn't fair. They continued to give God praise even in the storm. They continued to profess that even though their daughter would die, God is still good and they really didn't mean that. They knew there was a day coming. There's a day coming. Whenever wrong will be made right. Amen. There's a day coming when every seeming injustice will be made justified. There's a day coming when all is going to be fair. All is going to be fair. And today we're going to be looking in the Bible about what it prophesies, not just about vague things, but about you, okay? About your future. We tend to look at prophecy as if it's just some interesting thing, something off the side to, to, to uh, you know, to give us a little bit of curiosity. But prophecy is real. Prophecy is personal, especially to the Christian who will be in the middle of the prophecies. The final prophetic events leading into eternity are known simply as this, the day in the Bible. And that's not 24 hours. It's a period of time. But it's called the day. And some people look to one specific aspect of the judgment day. The day when all will be made fair. So let's take a moment. And I want us to read about this in Malachi 4, 1 through 3. For behold, the day is coming. 
burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch, but to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in His wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the sole of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. The day is near, He says. Now that sounds like a contradiction. We're still in the Old Testament here, right? How can the day... Be, be near. How could the day be coming like this, be close to us, and Him to say something like that 400 years before Jesus was born? Well, for five Old Testament prophets, working in four separate centuries, that day was always near. And it was always at hand, is what you'll see in the Scriptures. In the ninth century B.C., Obadiah 15, Joel 2.1, look at them. They say the day is near. The 8th century B.C., Isaiah 13, 6, it says the day is near. The 7th century B.C., Zephaniah 1, 7, it says the day is near. 6th century B.C., Ezekiel 30, verse 3, the day is near. Now, how do all these accounts not contradict? How does that occur? Each of these prophets saw an immediate event of his own generation as a direct, if not only a partial part of that day. And we do too, uh, in a sense. For example, Obadiah saw the event of the destruction of Edom. He saw that and he saw the day. A preview of coming events, you might say. Joel, it was a locust plague that wiped out all the food. And he's seen a little bit of the day coming. It's coming. Isaiah, it was the pending destruction of Jerusalem, which did occur, right? And the day... A little eye preview. We see places in our lives too where God brings judgment right now. Have you seen that before? Have you seen that before? Where God will bring judgment on a situation right then? Where God is making things fair right in the moment? May, uh, may not always be good though because fair can sometimes hurt us. You've done something wrong and you react and you got the repercussions of what you did, right? Now, there's no saying for that. You, you uh, reaped what you sowed, right? How many ever got what they sowed back to them and it wasn't too good, right? Sometimes we sow bad things and we get bad things back. Sometimes we sow good things and we get good things back. But sometimes God does that. You, you may have some enemy who has risen up against you to destroy you. But God, and there's no other explanation for it, arises and stops that in me. I've seen those times in my life where God intervened in the situation and I thought, there's no way this is going to work out. But He brought the day in, didn't He? He made things fair, didn't He? Maybe you've reaped what you've sown a little now and God's giving you a preview of the justice you deserve today too. See, God is bringing justice behind the scenes and righting wrongs right now, but He doesn't settle all of His accounts at this very moment. You understand? A lot of y'all think that. You think I can continue in that sin in which I'm doing over and over and over again and God doesn't see. Let me tell you, God sees. Alright? God views it. Everything. Everything is under God's NVR. He's recording it all. And He knows what you're doing. People, speaking of Judgment Day, they say, I've heard that all of my life. Have you ever heard somebody say that? The preacher starts talking about prophecy and somebody will say in, in, in Sunday morning, after dinner, you know, I've heard that all my life. I've heard that all my life. About Jesus coming back. About all them things that Revelation say occur. I can't put them all together, you know. But We see aspects of that day throughout all history. But one day will be the day Hitler was a type of antichrist. If God wanted the day to come right then, He could have used him for that, couldn't He? Amen. The Black Plague of the 1300s and COVID of 2020. God gave us a common attraction of the pestilence that it talks about there in the book of Revelation. If He wanted to use it right then, right there He could have used it, couldn't He? And the day had been here. When I was in high school, 
There was all this talk as I was getting out of high school about Operation Desert Storm, about a battle going over there in uh, around the area of Israel, and, and over in Iran, well, you know, everybody was getting kind of fearful. They were seeing a preview of what the day could have been, and God could have took that right then and caused the day to come about. Some of y'all wouldn't be sitting here right now if God used that and brought the day about right then. I can say that the day is coming. I can say it is soon. And I can be accurate by saying that. Why? It is always imminent. Imminent meaning it could happen at any moment. The event that could start it could occur at any second in time and there you would be. It could happen at any moment. And I want to ask you right here this morning, where would you be? Where would you be in that moment? In your walk with God right now, where would you be? A group of events will emerge that will surround the second coming of our Lord when He will destroy the whole earth according to Isaiah 13.5 and eventually reign as its king according to Zechariah 14. Let's take a little closer look at the day. It says here that it will burn like an oven. Burn like an oven. Some of y'all looking at me may have thought I've been through the oven after going to the beach this week, right? But no, I did not go through the oven, though at times it felt like it at 90-something degrees temperatures. See, fire in the Scripture often, it burns away the nonsense and it leaves the pure. That's what the fire does. See, this was the problem in Malachi's day. Everyone claimed that they were God's people, but not everyone lived like they were God's people. Amen. Everybody claimed it, but not everybody lived like it. When a hardship came or things didn't work out the way they wanted or they didn't praise Him in this storm, they rejected Him and just lived like the world, right? If it's a little hard, if it's a little difficult, if it ain't fair, I'll just go back to living like everybody else. And this day that we're looking at here today is going to purify the church. It'll purify it. Everything will be very clear in this day. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 3.13. It says, Every man's work shall be made manifest. That means clearly seen. For the day shall declare it. It's all going to be seen and it's going to be purified out and the fire is going to burn away all the nonsense, right? On that day. See, the day will reveal the wicked. What are the wicked? Let's define it. We see a wicked person. I, I, I would say very clearly right now, none of y'all would see yourselves as wicked here this morning, right? You never would apply that label to yourself at any point in time. But a wicked person, we think of the, the wicked witch and the Wizard of Oz or, or something of that nature, some really sick individual who does sick things. But do you know what God equates with wickedness? Not green makeup and a witch's hat. He equates pride with it. He equates an attitude with the word wicked. A know-it-all. Arrogant. Thinking you're better than God and everybody else and know better than God and everybody else. Pride. Pride. That's what God equates with being wicked. And it seems to make sense if you've read the rest of the Bible. Wickedness always grows from pride. Everything wicked comes from pride. Why did Satan fall from heaven? Isaiah 14. Look it up. Pride. Why do we not come to God for salvation? Why do we not come to this altar and pray? Why do we not seek God out? Pride. Look at James chapter 4. One day, all the pride is going to be burnt off the earth. It's going to make a, a big uh, dent within it, isn't it? And it says there's neither going to be left root nor branch. Now, now what does a root or a branch do? The root does what? It pulls the water up, doesn't it? That's what a root does. And the root, a branch, will come out of that. It will reveal the growth. There is nourishment coming through the plant, through the root, going to the branch. And right now, right now, there is for all the wicked and the good and everybody else, everybody on here, there's a little bit of water coming in there to give you a little bit of life, to give you a little bit of a branch, right? 
But no more that will come from God for the wicked on that day. Right now, rain falls on the just and on the unjust. But in that day, there will be no more provision for the wicked. Right now you have a benefit from God. You have a benefit of being here. But in that day you will not. Yet many in pride don't say thank you God. Huh? Thank you God for what I have. Thank you God for that nourishment that comes through the branch and up to the branch from the root. Many are ashamed of Him. Ashamed of their root. Ashamed of who gives them their, their, their strength. Ashamed. Or thinking they know better how to live their lives, and His Word clearly tells us. If you're filled with pride here today, I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Set your pride aside. Come to this altar. Set your pride aside and seek God out. And He has open hands for you here today. How many don't step out though because of pride? Pride. He goes on. To tell us it's also a day for the righteous. And let's define what righteous he is here. We think of someone who's always doing good and never fails. Somebody who's always doing good. That's the righteous. The problem is that there are no perfectly righteous individuals. There's only one who is righteous. Right? And that's Jesus. Jesus. But we have to trust and reverence Him. Give Him honor. Give Him praise. God defines the righteous here as those who fear my name. Do you fear the name of the Lord here today? Does it cause you a little unnervousness to think that the Lord is there? Do you have respect for God? Respect. Reverence. Remember a couple of weeks ago we looked at Malachi 3.16. We discussed a book of remembrance for those who feared God. God remembers those who fear Him, who respected Him, even in the midst of a generation that called good, bad, and bad, good. Right? Why? Because they feared the Lord. And what's in store for those who hold to and fears God in a culture that rejects Him at every turn? Well, the Scripture says there, there's healing. Do you need healing? Here this morning from, from the sin that's destroying you, that you don't even realize is destroying you, and many times that's causing your brain to be destroyed, the lust, the wickedness, the things of this world that corrupt us. You see, the Son of Righteousness will provide healing. And the righteous will welcome God's purifying fire. You know, the fire comes to the wicked and it burns them up. But the purifying fire comes to us and it gives us light. It gives us healing. We will see God was always there with us. And whatever hurt that you got in this life, whatever time it felt like it wasn't fair, He has the ointment of healing for you and glory, doesn't He? Amen. He'll heal you right here today if you'll just bend that knee and be thankful. He will. I, I need that healing for some of the hurts I've received. The pain I've endured in my life. The times I felt was unfair. And I felt times were unfair just like you felt times were unfair, okay? I need that son of righteousness to heal my wounds. Don't you? Don't you? Yeah. But we must step into the light to deal with the wounds that we have. The lost man hides from the light. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 3. We hear the famous verse of John 3.16, but do we ever look at John 3.19? It says, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. That light looks like it will burn them up. They don't want to get into that. But the righteous person, the one that wants to receive repentance, runs to the light. For everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. I remember when I was living in a sinful state. I didn't want to get too close to God. I didn't want to get too close to the church. I'd go to the very back pew. If there was a back pew behind the back pew, I'd be sitting in that that morning, okay? I didn't want to get close. Why? Because the light. The light. I didn't want to get close. 
I tried to ignore what was being said by the preacher. I was hiding from the light. But in the day that we're talking about, the day that's coming, ain't nobody hiding from the light. All right? Amen. Nobody's going to be able to hide. And the righteous will not want to hide. They'll want to come forward as they've always come forward. They will already be aware of the joy of living in the light of God. The peace of knowing that I can come out and I don't have anything to hide. Right? I don't have anything to hide. I'll give it all to God. Right? There's peace in that. There, there, there's healing in that. Isn't there? Amen. And they will know the healing in His wings. The same light that heals the wounds and purifies them is going to burn everything else up in that day. In that day for the righteous, listen to what it says here. It says there'll be healing in His wings. In His wings. Well, that's all. There's a lot of hurt in this life. But God's going to take all, care of all of that when everything comes to life. There's going to be something happen one day that we're going to be carried up by the wings. All right? We're going to be flying through the air. Okay? The Scripture talks about it, doesn't it? First Thessalonians chapter 4. It's called the rapture. A lot of people make fun of it online. They mock it like, like ungodly people always do. But the Bible says there's going to come a day in the blink of an eye it's going to be revealed who was true and who was not. Those who know Jesus won't be sitting in these pews anymore. Amen. They'll be up in glory. They'll be pulled out with the wings the light of righteousness will shine on this earth. And the, the dead in Christ shall rise first is what it says. Those people that are in the graves right now, this is the church's resurrection. They're going to come up out of those graves. And you know what's going to happen next? Boom! We're going to be with them in the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye, we'll be gone. My family members who are dead in Christ will be gone. And praise the Lord, only on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll be able to go up with them. Amen. <laughs> Only on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll be able to go up with them in that day. We'll fly through the clouds. And the light will reveal it, won't it? The light will reveal it. On that day, those faithful Christians who seemingly died early in their life, it seemed unfair that they died, they're going to fly on eagles' wings out of those graves, aren't they? On that day, it says here, doesn't it? You shall go out. Go out or go forth like stall-fed calves. The farmer may know this. When calves are confined to a stall for a very long time, you ever watch them? Sometimes I see my poodle this way too. If it's been confined in a little area, woo, it jumps when it comes out of there, doesn't it? Gets excited when it runs out of that little area. And, and a calf that's been caught in from the stall, it comes out and leaps for sheer joy when it's turned out into the sunlight. And this is the rapture at the first part of the day that's coming. But at the end of this day, this period of time of God's judgment and making every wrong right, we are going to come back with Him. We're going to come back with Him. This is what the Bible says. Look here at our final verse here, verse 3. It tells us the day that the day the righteous will return. It says there, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. And on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, you might ask, why and when will we trample the wicked? What? Under the soles of our feet. Why would we do that? Because we will come back with Him to judge the world in righteousness after the rapture. Seven years is what I understand it to be. Seven years this world will go through hell on earth. Read Revelation 4 through 19. And in chapter 19... It tells me this. Now I saw, verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And His name is called the Word of God. Look in John, you'll see. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed Him on white horses. I ain't too good on a horse, but I'm going to get better on that day. 
Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he will strike the nations. He's going to wipe everything out with the word of his mouth, the same way he created everything, with the word of his mouth. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's you and me that long for His appearing. Or is it? Or is it? Which side will you be on that day? See, we're coming behind Him. I'm not fighting. I don't have a sword. I'm just riding behind Him. And we're going to trample the wicked in front of Him. Where are you at? Are you in front of Him and He's coming down with the wrath of Almighty God? Or are you behind Him and following Him as His wrath runs through? This world, this world's going away. Christ is going to build His millennial kingdom on it. 1 John 2, 17, As the world passed away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. So it might not seem fair right now, but Jesus is coming back. Every once in a while, you'll see someone holding a sign out on a street corner or, or, or just hung it up somewhere along the road or, or there'll be somebody, they'll be making fun of it in a movie, you know. They'll say, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. You might laugh right now when you see that, but it's true. <laughs> you think it. You think it isn't because it doesn't seem fair right now. But it's true. Right now, the devil is providing the policies in Washington, D.C. But Jesus is coming back. Right now, death is taking away followers of Christ when we need more followers of Christ. But Jesus is coming back. Right now, the good people aren't getting as much as the bad people who are cheating the system, right? But Jesus is coming back. Life doesn't seem fair when a little girl who stood up for Jesus dies young, does it? But Jesus is coming back. And we need to remember in these days not to question God, not to question Him in that way, but to be thankful for what He's provided. It's all a change of attitude. It's all a change of how you look at things. It's all a change in how we see it. We see that God has prepared many things for us in His mercy. And He's prepared a way for us in that day that I have a horse to ride on. Right? In His mercy. And that's how we overcome the it's not fair mentality by giving thanks to God. We remind ourselves to be thankful for what He's given us not to be unthankful for what He hasn't because it's all in His good pleasure what He has given us, isn't it? Amen. My burden here, as was Malachi's, is to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day?